Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we've brought together to the main stage two accomplished financial and legal professionals to speak about wealth building for women and communities of color. We have managing director of, uh, of Multicultural Strategic Clients segments for UBS, and we also have Sean White, who is a financial professional, financial professional and lawyer uh, and strategic counsel uh, advisor for a number of family offices. So we'll begin with just uh, a few questions. Uh, each of you have spent a considerable amount of time and energy focused on closing the wealth gap for women and communities of color. Can you both share why you've been so passionate about this topic and why should we be uh, as well? Sure, I can dive right in. And thanks so much, Felix, and I'm excited to be here. So the reason I am so excited about this, because I think it's an urgent issue based on the changing demographics of the country. A recent Cerulli report shows us that about $84 trillion in wealth is about to transfer from the baby boomer generation really to largely millennials, right? And those millennials are very different than earlier generations. Specifically of note, 44% of millennials are multicultural. So they identify as one of those diverse cultures, black, Asian American, Hispanic or Latino, or another ethnic minority. So that for us is really a call to action that if we want to continue to remain relevant not just in the financial industry, but really in any industry. We need to make sure that we are catering to our audience and catering to the clients that we need to serve. So that's why I'm so thrilled and excited about it. Again, agree with everything that Mel just said. Want to give a little bit of an introduction about who I am. So I am a general counsel and sort of a strategic advisor to various family offices and foundations and in the past have represented people such as the billionaire Eli Broad, um, President Obama's foundation, and most recently Will and Jada Pinkett Smith. And one of the things that that gives me is a vantage point over my career in New York on Wall Street and then in private practice and then working for individual family offices is a little bit of a vantage point on how people who have uh, wealth and who have intergenerational wealth to pass along what some of the strategies that they have are that have put them in those positions. And I'm passionate about closing the wealth gap because I think it's possible. I think that what the strategies show is that with the right planning and thoughtfulness and community and collective action, we can close the wealth gap. There are tools that are available to us and there are road, you know, roadmaps and game plans from families that have had high levels of income and wealth over the years that we can follow. We just need to communicate with one another and create more infrastructure around financial literacy, financial wellness, and uh, preparing our children for this next stage and the demographic shift that Mel is talking about. Because if we don't do that, we know that the, this country, the changing face of this country, is going to become browner and more feminine when it comes to who controls the purse strings and the wealth when that wealth transfer happens to millennials. And to our detriment, if we don't prepare them to be in charge of the US economy and US GDP. And so one of the things, you know, we all know the billionaire Warren Buffett who says never bet against America, right? We, we have so much innovation and entrepreneurship and all kinds of other things, but can we really say that if we're not preparing the next generation to move those things forward and to create the businesses that create jobs? So that's why I'm really passionate. I think it's possible, but we have to be, one, passionate, and two, very proactive about closing the wealth gap. Sean, and, and for you as well, Mel, so you, know, we, you mentioned Warren Buffett, the Obamas, Smith's family. Uh, Mel, you're at UBS, you're dealing with uh, philanthropic dollars from wealthy individuals, but um, we have people in the room who uh, may not fit into that category, including myself. Uh, 
What do you say to someone who may be working for Wells Fargo and as an account executive, or someone who works for Prudential, or someone who works at a car dealership? How do, you know, when we talk about closing the racial wealth gap for women and communities of color, how do we start from a practical standpoint? You know, Sean and I were just talking about this backstage that no matter your wealth level, the lessons really are the same in terms of how you're thinking about all of the assets that you bring to the table. And so I want to take a step back a bit and really talk about what I mean when I say wealth. Because I think it would be a mistake to say that it's just a financial concept. It's not. Wealth is the accumulation of, of course, financial capital, but also your intellectual capital and the knowledge and know-how that you bring to the table, as well as social capital, relational management and relationships that you may have, connections, access, and then finally, human capital, your mental well-being and your physical well-being. So it's the culmination of all of those things, less the outlay that you had to acquire them. So when we think about intellectual, intellectual capital, for example, the student loans that you had to undertake, perhaps, in order to attain that education. But stepping back, when I think about it, it really is the same thing across all families. We're constantly thinking about what you spend, what you save, what you invest. Ensuring that you are well planned is something that is applicable to any level of wealth. Yeah, when I think about wealth or the concept of wealth, if we want to just go in that direction, I think about what assets and resources you can bring to bear. So it really is, it's to Mel's point about more than just money. And when I think of assets and resources, I think of the people you know, um, the community you live in and how close-knit that community is, um, the people you know who have jobs in other industries who can explain to you how other things work. I mean, there's a, there is more to wealth than just money. But when we're talking about, for me, closing the wealth gap, we're talking about putting financial assets into the hands of women and people of color with the training that they need for financial wellness, right? So it's, we want our businesses to get the capital that they need. We want our young people to get the capital that they need with respect to being able to go to college and have education and things along that, those lines. So it's not just the money that's in your pocket, but it's the resources that you can bring to bear for your household and for your family. And some of that, I mean, look, we're at a conference where we have people who are elected officials speaking and talking. And some of that is, what resources are your children's schools getting or public schools getting, right? Wealth is about being able to allocate those resources to the highest and best use within your life and within your community. So it's, it's bigger than that when we're talking about closing the wealth gap. Even though I deal with individuals and families, I recognize that this is not something that each of us is going to close by ourselves on our own. We do need our legislative officials and those who fund our schools and our school boards to be teaching financial literacy to our children. And we need them to know how to balance their checkbook and what to do with the money when we leave it for them and we have it for them. So there are so many different areas that you can attack this from. And so even though we may not um, to Felix's point, all you could get to the place or have the money of Bill and Melinda Gates. There are aspects of wealth that are about the quality of living and the lives that we have and that we share within our families and within our communities that I want to think about as part of closing that wealth gap. And so there are so many places to do that. Again, for what Mel said about, you know, thinking of the things that ultra high net worth individuals are thinking about, if that's you know, do you have the appropriate levels of insurance on your home? Are you fully utilizing your 401k? Are you, um, you know, uh, taking the, the match for your giving that your company provides? I mean, there are a lot of ways to think of bringing more resources to bear to the benefit of your family and your community. I think that's right. And I think when you think about tactical things that you can do um, to close the wealth gap, I think there's an individual and a collective uh, path forward. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the research that we've seen and is why the wealth gap continues to get bigger. In addition to a lot of the institutional barriers that exist, what we're seeing in, the, in terms of the legacy of lack of financial access, what we see is that wealth is really 
when you think about the pathways to wealth, there's really only a handful of ways to get there. Entrepreneurship, investing, inheritance, real estate. It's pretty much, those are pretty much the pathways mm -hmm. to wealth. But when you think about, and research shows, our own investor advance report, we think about, we've, we've tracked sort of multicultural millionaires and how they've built their wealth versus millionaires overall. I, what is interesting about that pathway is that the majority of millionaires overall have built their wealth largely through investments. However, multicultural millionaires are only half as likely to have done that. They take a circuitous, circuitous path, largely due to lack of access. So you see real estate as a very common pathway to wealth. And that's largely due to lack of trust. You know, well-deserved in many instances. So real estate, um, really build, being saving and being incredibly good savers, those are the pathways that people have taken. However, what I would say from a financial perspective is that those are, tend to be longer trajectories to build wealth. It's not to say you shouldn't invest in real estate. It's not to say, particularly in this economic environment, that holding on to some liquidity is a bad thing. It just means that diversification is key. You know, interestingly enough, uh, last week, Monday, uh, our firm, Urban Capital Network, along with our nonprofit organization, the Innovation Center for Urban Entrepreneurship, uh, hosted 50 African American men at the White House to talk about this exact issue. Mm -hmm. um, the the ask of the White House was to facilitate uh, to the funding of investor accelerators across the country to, for the very reason you mentioned. It's the lack of knowledge and the quickest way to create wealth is through investing, is what everyone else does, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, this question is for you, Mel. You know, uh, you have con you may have colleagues in the room who are also with philanthropy. How does the philanthropic community uh, believe, or if they believe, that they should be playing a role in closing the racial wealth gap? And then, how do you get those folks who have this concentration of money uh, to evolve to get to the point where they're willing to help? tackle this challenge? Yeah, so I think that the main takeaway I want you to take from this is traditional philanthropy is not going to solve the wealth gap. It will not. And by traditional philanthropy, I mean someone writing, writing a grant on an individual basis to an institution, and that's it. We've been trying those models for decades, and they have not moved the needle significantly. So what I would posit is that we need to have a new model, one that moves to a collective form of action, collective philanthropy, one that also moves beyond the philanthropic capital to take a look at the rest of the capital stack and looking at things like impact investing, which you can do with the other part of your balance sheet. And by impact investing, I mean investing intentionally to create positive, measurable, outcomes in environmental and social causes while still achieving a financial return. So I think moving beyond the limitations of traditional philanthropy are one of the ways, and we've seen some early indicators of success that way. Uh, Sean, so you represent a number of family offices. Can you tell us what a family is? How do you become one? Uh, and how and if a family office can be used for the purpose of closing the racial wealth gap, and if so, how would they go about doing it? Sure. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about um, the interplay between Mel and I is that we've both represented family offices. I've represented most recently single family offices, which is around the investments in the portfolio of one family. And Mel has spent time, and UBS offers services around multifamily offices. And so that's when you have an anchor principal client if it's a standalone multifamily office and some other families around that that are uh, potentially at a slightly different level of wealth. And so there are a, a few ways to think about it. When I think about it, um, family offices, the, the joke is that if you've met one family office, you've met one family office because they're customized for what families need. 
we tend to think of them predominantly, especially on the institutional side, as a wealth management investment vehicle. So who's managing your money? But depending on how complicated a family's life is, it also includes household services and management, management of their philanthropy, just sort of every issue that a, that a family may uh, face, business management, payroll, a whole host of things when you're thinking of a single family office. And so um, whether or not you focus on a single family or a multifamily, or if you have your family office services embedded within an institution, is a very personal discussion about kind of levels of wealth and complexity around what families want to do. So I have the benefit of having worked for single family offices for families that had very clear vision about what they wanted to do with their philanthropy, how they wanted to invest their money, and that has been a real joy for me. It dovetails back to what Mel was just talking about in terms of social impact and social impact strategies, because one thing that I've been seeing as a trend for ultra high net worth individuals and high net worth individuals who have family offices is this concept around direct investment, which is important to all of us, because the goal is that it will, in some respects, alleviate the fact that venture capital and private equity are not investing in businesses of women and people of color, except at single digits, that families on the other side of that uh, who have money, um, including some of those that I've worked with, have decided, well, okay, if the traditional money managers don't care about investing with women and people of color and they're not agnostic, then we want to start to invest directly because, like I said, Warren Buffett said, we want to bet on America and we know that their demographic changes. So one of the wonderful things uh, tying this to the social impact investing on the direct investing side from family offices is that you're seeing more of an opportunity as entrepreneurs or small business owners to get connected and individually, sort of, I say, Shark Tank style. You know, it's which one of, the, and in some respects, that's what it is. Which one of the sharks who has a bunch of money wants to invest directly, and why are they doing that? They're doing that because institutions are not changing how they invest to invest in the businesses and the causes that people care about. So families have said, you know what? If our wealth advisors are not going to invest in women and people of color, or they're not going to tell us, you know what, it's not just about return, but we understand you want social capital as a part of your return, and they're not going to invest your money in things like uh, health equity or uh, you know, reducing the maternal mortality rate in this country or clean justice initiatives in underserved communities of color, then we're going to go out and do that directly. Because, yeah, we want a return on our money, but we also want to live in a country where uh, people are recognized for their contributions and their ability to innovate, and we're funding the best businesses, not just the whitest businesses. And so that's a, an amazing lesson I see, and I implore anyone in the room who works for financial and traditional wealth advisors to get with that program, or you're going to find that the millennials and the next gen that are moving into their parents' money as we do the transition from the boomers to millennials don't want to invest with you because you're not answering some of the pressing issues that are important to them. And that's one of the things that I see on the horizon for family offices that has me just really, really excited about um, how we might see change and real and good change in the country. I have sat with some of my families that I represent getting presentations from traditional wealth advisors, and they ask, okay, well, how do I know that what you're doing is also going to move the needle in something that I care about? And when we get answers that say we don't know, they leave in frustration, and what they're turning around and doing is finding those opportunities themselves. So that's a good thing, a very good thing. Yeah, I think that's right. I think if you are not paying attention to the trends and the change, you will be left behind. Yeah. Thank you. So one last, one last question. So we, we're in the end of December at this point, uh, ending the year. We're going to be going through to 2024. Uh, is there one thing you would suggest that uh, a strategy that we can employ to help uh, take a, an affirmative step to creating wealth in the future? Sure. I mean, as I, as I think about it, investing for impact really means taking a look at the world's most pressing problems and figuring out who is solving them. A good example that we at UBS feel strongly about is diabetes and obesity in terms of healthcare challenges. And that tends to disproportionately affect communities of color. So those who invest in 
solutions that really tackle that challenge are what we're really excited about in 2024. And actually the pullback that we're seeing in the market creates an attractive entry point to really invest in companies that are driving solutions in that space. So that's one example, if I say nothing else. And I think we all know the crazes that we've seen and read about around um, weight loss management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but those are the kinds of things, and we, that's the approach that I think we should be taking a step back and thinking about. Clean tech would be another one. Fantastic. That is resonating quite well. I guess if I could make a, a plea, it would be, uh, I was at a talk recently where they were giving the statistics about how many of our HBCUs are in broadband deserts. And one of the kind of predictions for who will make money and create in intergenerational wealth in the future will be those who are tackling the problems that businesses are currently facing. And one of the major problems that businesses are facing is the collection and maintenance and digitization of data. And so there is all of this data coming out, and to the extent that we can lobby and push for children in primary education at our HBCUs and, col and women's colleges to have access to the tools to train themselves to create solutions around data and technology, we will have the potential to launch the next group of billionaires and hopefully the black and brown and women faces that I'll be able to support in the future. So push for that uh, around your communities. Thank you both. Right. Thank you both.